An Airbus A350 is a final approach in for runway 25 in Paris or Lee Airport. The first officer is pilot flying and he has just disconnected the autopilot, getting ready for a nice manual approach when suddenly, from out of nowhere, this warning sounds in the cockpit. Go around, wind shear ahead. The captain immediately calls for a go around and initially the first officer responds to this, but very soon it becomes clear that something is not right as things are starting to go very wrong inside of this cockpit. Stay tuned. A huge thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. French B Flight 711 was a flight scheduled to fly from San Francisco in the United States over towards Paris Orly in France. The flight took place on the 4th of February 2020 and on board the flight was 206 passengers, 10 cabin crew and 3 flight crew members. Now the reason there were three flight crew members was that the flight was uh, scheduled to be more than 11 hours long and in that case you need an augmenting pilot so that all pilots during the flight could take a period of rest of about three hours each. The pilot flying was going to be the first officer for this leg and he reported that he was feeling good, he had slept well prior to the flight and during the flight he selected the middle slot for his in-flight rest which meant that he actually got to sleep for a full one and a half hours during that 11 hour flight. The first officer was a 45 year old male. Uh, he had 8,600 hours of total time and 1,200 hours on the Airbus A330 and Airbus A350. Together with him, acting as pilot monitoring on this flight was the captain. He is a 41 year old male with 8,000 hours of total time and 2,000 hours on the Airbus A350. And interestingly enough, the captain had actually done a simulator session earlier on where he had flown together with this first officer and they had practiced in capacitation, particularly during um, takeoff. But that's just an interesting kind of tidbit to remember. The relief pilot was a 50 year old female pilot and uh, she was sitting on the jump seat when this all occurred but her actions during the incident is still going to be important. The destination airport that the crew was flying into, Paris Orly, has three active runways but the two that is going to be interesting for this particular incident is runway 25 that was used for arrival aircraft with an ILS approach and runway 24 which was used for departing traffic. Because of the way that the runways were situated, it meant that if an aircraft was doing an approach in for runway 25 and then had to do a missed approach, it would potentially come into conflict with departing traffic from runway 24. And because of that, the missed approach procedure was built to mitigate that threat. So if you had to do a missed approach procedure from runway 25, you had to go straight ahead to 700 feet but not turning before the missed approach point. And at 700 feet, you need to initiate a left-hand turn with a maximum of 185 knots to roll out on heading 199 degrees at a maximum altitude of 2,000 feet. Now, 2,000 feet is a fairly low missed approach altitude. It means that if you do a go around higher up than your minimums, there's going to be a lot of things that you have to do in a very short time span. And that's going to become really important here. The first part of this flight was completely normal and uneventful, so we're not going to pay too much attention to that. Instead, we're going to focus on the approach, which is where the action happened. About 30 minutes prior to their estimated landing, the first officer started setting up and briefing for the approach. And when he looked through the weather, the weather looked fine. There was a cloud layer at 4,500 feet, uh, there was some towering cumulus in the area, and there was a fairly moderate to occasional strong wind from a northwesterly direction. But nothing that would indicate any kind of threat, at least from the weather, to this approach. Instead, the crew initiated their descent. Everything was normal. They were handed over eventually to Orly Tower. And the first officer started flying the normal instrument landing system, ILS approach in for runway 25. They broke through the clouds at about 4,500 feet, which would have meant that they would have seen the runway in front of them. And because it was all nicely stabilized, the first officer decided that he wanted to hand fly the approach a little bit to get a little bit of uh, practice, which is good, especially for long haul crews that maybe not hand fly as much. He disconnected the autopilot at about 1,400 feet. And only four seconds after that, a predictive wind shear warning was heard in the cockpit. Go around, wind shear ahead, wind shear ahead. This took the flight crew by complete surprise because there was nothing in the weather that would indicate that a predictive windshield warning was to be expected. 
the problem with the predictive wind chill warning is that that warning is taken from the weather radar system and in some cases uh, wind blowing over large buildings for example can give rise to what we call a spurious predictive wind chill warnings and there's actually notes in the manuals about that and if the weather is good enough the crew have the right to disregard that. Okay? A predictive wind shear warning is very different from an active wind shear warning, which is when the ground proximity warning system tells the crew that they're actually in a wind shear. But in this case, the crew was startled by the warning and the captain immediately asked for a go around. The first officer complied with the go around request from the captain. He advanced the thrust lever into the toga mode, which gives full go around thrust. He started to pitch up because remember, he was flying manually at this point. And he also asked for go around flaps to be set. The captain responded to this. He called to air traffic control that they were going around. Air traffic control came back and said, okay, go around, follow the standard go around procedure to 2000 feet. Now things are starting to happen in a quite rapid succession because they went around at about 1,350 feet. And remember, the go-around altitude is only 2,000 feet, so it's only about 600 feet to climb. The first officer reduced the climb from Toga back to the uh, soft go-around thrust instead. A soft go-around thrust is a, a mode that is used when there is not an immediate need for a very high climb rate. It makes the go-around maneuver slower and softer for everyone involved. And it's designed to put thrust, it gives about 2,000 feet per minute rate of climb. This was something that the captain specifically asked for. The first officer now pitches for about eight degrees pitch up, following initially the flight director mode, because the flight director is still indicating how he's supposed to fly, even though he's flying manually. But very quickly, he starts drifting slightly towards the right of the indicated track. And because the flight director knows that they're supposed to level off at 2,000 feet, they very quickly start indicating that he needs to both start pitching down in order to capture 2,000 feet, and also he needs to bring the thrust levels back from the soft go around mode into what's called a CL mode, which basically engages the outer throttle and facilitates a level off. But this doesn't happen. Instead, the uh, pitch remains at about 8 degrees nose up and the flight directors continue to show that he needs to pitch down immediately and he also needs to turn slightly to the left to follow the missed approach track. But none of this is happening. At the same time, the captain is retracting the landing gear, he is continuing to retract the flaps, but he realizes that something is off because as the flight director goes into what's called altitude star mode, which is basically its altitude acquire mode, the captain calls this out. He calls out speed and alt star, which is the FMA reading at the time, but he doesn't get any response from the first officer. Instead, the aircraft continues to climb with a climb rate of about 1800 feet per minute and both the captain and the relief pilot realizes that at this rate they are going to bust through the uh, 2,000 feet missed approach altitude and they call that out to the first officer but he does not respond to anything of this he just continues to climb with the same pitch up and without making any adjustments to his track what is happening to the first officer right now is likely what we call a partial incapacitation. And uh, we're going to talk much more about that later on in this episode. But it's most likely caused by the sudden onset of very high workload that came out of absolutely nowhere where he did not expect it. And it causes him to freeze up and to not hear anything and not react to normal stimuli. At time 17, 0005, the aircraft busts through 2000 feet and continues to climb. And as it climbs through, 2200 feet the altitude warning comes on and it sounds continuously in the cockpit about 24 seconds later the aircraft reaches 2750 feet and here the first inputs on the first officer's side stick is noted he starts to level the aircraft off and at the same time as he's doing this the captain pulls on the altitude knob on the mode control panel now when he does that it sends a signal to the aircraft that it needs to engage in descent mode to descend back to the 2000 feet that has been set on the mode control panel and it also tells the same to the outer throttle which is now in the CL mode. So this means that the thrust is now going back towards idle, the flight directors are indicating a left descending turn but since the first officer is still flying manually nothing of this is happening. The aircraft is continuing straight ahead. 
Now the aircraft passes overhead the threshold from runway 25 and air traffic control calls them up and tells them to turn left heading 180 degrees. The captain responds to that saying that they have climbed up to 3000 feet but they're now descending down to 2000 feet again and that they're turning left heading 180. Air traffic control responds to that and said that yes you have departing traffic at about four miles ahead at your one o'clock position. So now there is traffic that is coming up and into their direct flight path. The captain reaches up and inputs 180 degrees on the mode control panel. The flight directors are now starting to indicate that left hand turn towards 180 degrees instead of following the initial missed approach procedure. But once again, the first officer is not doing anything. He is sitting there and they're now flying straight towards that conflicting traffic. This is where the captain decides to take controls. This is about 52 seconds after the aircraft had flown past the missed approach altitude. The captain says, my controls, and he inputs uh, autopilot number one. By doing so, the aircraft starts to turn to follow the flight directors. But as the captain is doing this, the first officer, without saying anything to anyone, reaches over and pulls out the speed brake. What this does is that VLS, the Velocity Lowest Selectable, which is a minimum speed on the Airbus, goes up to 188 knots and the aircraft is currently at 175 knots. So this gives a speed, speed, speed warning in the cockpit. This catches the uh, captain completely out of surprise and he does what any pilot would do when they hear that kind of warning. He puts the thrust up to toga to get as much thrust as possible out of the engine and he starts inputting forward on his side stick. When he does so, the fact that he's increasing the thrust means that the speed brakes that were extended now automatically retract. But since the speed brake lever is still out and the speed brakes are not out, this causes a conflict in the computer and it generates a master caution warning which just adds to the workload of the captain. Also, the fact that he is pitching forward on the side stick disconnects the autopilot that he had just connected and it removes the flight director. So he's now flying without flight directors and in a perceived low speed situation with a master caution warning ahead of him. So you can imagine that the stress of the captain would be really high right now. Air traffic control now once again calls them up and tells them to continue that turn onto heading 180 degrees to avoid the traffic. But there's no response from the flight crew. It's very likely that the captain is just inundated with the workload at this point. The aircraft is now descending with a fairly high descent rate, 2,200 feet per minute. And at time 170126, they once again cross through their missed approach altitude of 2,000 feet. This is also where they get into the closest uh, proximity to the departing traffic from a 24. They get within 1.69 nautical miles and about 75 feet vertically. And that triggers an STCA, a short term conflict alert in the air traffic control tower. But in the cockpit, they're unaware of this. It's not close enough for the TCAS to issue a resolution advisory. Um, it's just in the control tower that they realize how close these aircraft are to each other. The captain undershoots the target altitude, but about 150 feet. You can see that he is inputting on his side stick to try to level the aircraft off. Remember that he still doesn't have any flight directors, so it's not flying very accurately at this point. And throughout this maneuver, the augmenting pilot that's sitting on the jump seat have been calling the flight crew to please engage the autopilot to try to reduce the workload and to get more help from the automatics. It seems like at this point the first officer kind of wakes up a little bit from his paralysis because he clearly heard that the argument pilot was asking for the autopilot to be engaged. But because he is still not really fully in the situation, he just reaches over and engages the autopilot number two without telling the captain that he's doing so. The captain looks down on his FMA and doesn't understand why all of a sudden an autopilot is engaged and the uh, modes on the FMA is saying that it's in vertical speed minus 650 feet per minute and also that the heading select has been engaged but not on 180 degrees that he had selected earlier but at the heading that they were when the autopilot was engaged of 228 degrees. The captain now just reaches over and engages autopilot one again and then states very clearly in the cockpit Everyone is silent. I am the only one giving orders. Now, on the surface, that might sound very harsh, but if you think about it, up until this point, there's been complete pandemonium in this cockpit. There's been people pushing buttons that shouldn't have, pulling levers, and on several occasions, the uh, hands of both pilots have been crossing each other as they were 
pushing buttons on the mode control panel. That has to stop. And the way that the captain is doing this by making a clear order is kind of aimed at restoring order, making sure that everyone knows who is flying and who is doing what, and to kind of calm things down and get this aircraft back in under control again. But as he's doing this, the aircraft is still descending and it reaches a minimum altitude of 1,550 feet before the captain once again disconnects the autopilot but making inputs on his side stick, this time to get the aircraft to start climbing, adding thrust again, the aircraft is climbing back up and pulling the altitude knob to reset the flight directors into a climb mode. At this point he also calls that traffic control and tells them that he is indeed turning left heading 180 according to their instructions. Air traffic control responds with saying thank you for the information, uh, traffic is very close, I suggest that you turn quickly. And he responds to this. Air traffic control also tells him that he can continue to climb to 3000 feet. Now there's no response once again from uh, the captain when they cleared him for this. So they call him again, reminding him that he's cleared to 3000 feet. This time he reads it back. And during the climb, the uh, speed increases to 281 knots, which is pretty fast. And he has also a fairly high climb speed, but this time he levels off in time. He brings the speed back to 220 knots and he gets the autopilot engaged once again. And before I continue what happens after this, here is a short word from my sponsor. I also want to take a few seconds here to say a special thank you to the sponsor of this episode, which is Skillshare. Now, I know that you are watching this because you are a curious person, a lifelong learner, someone who constantly wants to improve and understand the world around you better. And in that case, Skillshare is definitely something that you should be checking out, okay? They have thousands of high quality video courses and pretty much anything that you can imagine. A course that I'm using myself at the moment is 5 Minutes Creativity with Jasmine Cheyenne, where she gives kind of hands-on tips on how to chisel out a few minutes to be creative every single day. And it's something that I personally really need. But there are also courses in, you know, storytelling, creative photography, or even how to use your own home simulator to improve and prepare before you start your private pilot license. So if you think, Peter, that sounds amazing. Well then, the 1,000 first of you guys who clicks on this link here below will get one month of premium Skillshare absolutely for free. So click the link and start exploring your curiosity today. This whole sequence from when the aircraft got the predictive windshield warning until the aircraft was stabilized again at 3,000 feet took only four minutes. Okay? I'm sure that it felt like an eternity for the crew that was involved. As the crew had stabilized itself at 3,000 feet, the first officer kind of got back into it again and he said that he felt fine and that he could resume the role of pilot monitoring to take the radio and the captain accepted that. They went in and they did an uneventful landing on runway 25 after another ILS approach. But how come that something like this could happen in the first place? What happened to the first officer and what can be done to make sure it doesn't happen again? When the report of this incident came to the attention of the air incident investigators, they realized quite quickly that this was a very serious incident. You had several altitude busts, which is defined to when an aircraft departs from its cleared altitude with more than 300 feet. On top of that, potential uh, pilot incapacitation and a air prox to another traffic and low speed alert. So they started looking into what had led up to this. How come that it went this far? And they divided it into the role of the captain, the role of the first officer, but also the role of the airport. Now, when it came to the first officer, he said that he didn't feel fatigued or anything, but that he was extremely surprised when the predictive windshield warning occurred. And that when he started the go around maneuver, he, he kind of welt into something that felt like slow motion. He didn't hear the call outs or the warnings from neither the aircraft or his colleagues. And everything was kind of like in a daze until after the actual um, incident was almost over. He had no recollection of pulling the speed brake lever or why he engaged the second autopilot without telling his colleague. But why would the first officer react this way because of a go around? I mean, he would have briefed it about 40 minutes earlier in his approach briefing. And isn't this something that pilots should be ready to take on at any given point? Well, here is where some statistics about go around is actually quite important. So a go around happens typically between two to four times every 1000 flights. And what that means is that for a medium haul pilot like myself, 
that equates to about one go around per year. But for a long haul pilot, that means that he or she will be doing a go around maybe once every five to 10 years. So in reality, it is an extremely unlikely thing that will happen, especially when the weather is expected to be good. So that would mean that the first officer in this case would have been seeing the uh, runway straight ahead. He's disconnected, which by the way means that he's flying manually, which is not something long haul crews would be doing that often anyway. And all of a sudden from out of nowhere, you have this predictive wind shear warning that would have just thrown him out of his pace. And then immediately the captain calls for a go around and in the back of his head, he just remembers that this is a very complicated go around with an early turning altitude and with the speed restriction and stuff. And all of this together can lead to something that we call a cognitive incapacitation. That means that the overflow of workload and sudden onset of ooh, 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 okay what's happening and I need to this I need to remember that and just basically makes the brain temporarily shut down and I see this fairly often when I'm training new pilots in the simulator where the workload becomes too high or where you have a sudden onset of stress that they did not expect so this happens from time to time. So this would fall under something called subtle incapacitation. And a subtle incapacitation is really hard to diagnose for the remaining pilot. Because what we practice in the simulator generally is what we call a total incapacitation. That's when the other pilot just stops functioning completely, either due to a heart attack, for example, or just fainting. And of course, when that happens, it's very clear what you need to do, right? You need to take control of the aircraft, you need to control of the, all of the switches that see that they're in the right order, you need to use automatics, you need to call a mayday to air traffic control because you're now the only pilot working, and you need to call in uh, some cabin crew to help you and to try to help the pilot who is incapacitated. So that's all very, very clear. But in this case, the first officer was still there. He was still inputting on the controls. It just didn't make any sense what he was doing. And in that case, it becomes even more important that the remaining pilot take the control and calls that out very clearly. And also in the case of the Airbus, uses the button on the side stick and holds that in for 40 seconds because that will give priority to whoever is holding in the button and it will also disengage the uh, side stick on the opposite side. And it's made for exactly this kind of circumstance. Now, when it came to the captain, he also said All that he was very, very ahead. surprised by the predictive windshield warning. And when he called the go around, he was also surprised by the fact that the first officer wasn't really following the procedure. He was still inputting on the controls, but there was definitely something wrong. But because this was a subtle incapacitation, it was hard for him to diagnose it. Hence, it took longer for him to take over the controls. He said basically that it felt like a simulator scenario, but in real life where you had pilot capacitation, altitude busts, um, traffic close by, low speed alerts, everything happening at once. The investigation team heard this and they came with a recommendation that startle training should be included in future pilot simulator training. They know that the simulator training that pilots are doing at the moment, um, even though it's varied, most pilots kind of know what's going to happen. So it would be very beneficial to introduce a startle factor at some point during the training program so that the pilots would know how they react when something like that happened and also get guidance on how to do it better in the future. They also refer to what's known as the Airbus Golden Rules, which is if you find yourself in a situation like this, one, fly the aircraft, aviate, navigate, communicate. Two, use autopilot at an appropriate level to give you a little bit of support. Three, always know what your FMA is telling you. You know, understand your FMA. And three, take action if things are not going as expected. On top of this, the uh, investigation team also went into Paris Orly and had a look at the missed approach procedure because of the very low level of altitude and the complexity of having to level off at a low altitude while you were most likely in a turn at lower than normal speed. And they gave a recommendation to look at the feasibility of increasing the go around altitude from 2000 feet to 3000 feet to make that go around just a little bit more user friendly for the pilots. And that's something that I full heartedly agree with.
Another thing that the investigation team thought might be a good idea to implement is to maybe do a bit of a short recap of the approach briefing just prior to actually intercepting the localizer and glide slope. So to do kind of, okay, so we're coming in here now in case we have to go around. Remember that it's just straight ahead 700 feet, left turn 185 knots, climbing to 2000 feet, which by the way, is a really low level off, so be ready for that. Something quick and concise like that would probably just kind of recap it for both pilots so that they're aware of it and also remind them that a go around is a possibility in any approach that you do even if the weather looks like it's really good now to answer the question that i know undoubtedly would come did these pilots receive any reprimands did they lose their jobs are they still flying the answer to that is i don't know and my guess would be that they're probably still flying after a little bit of retraining potentially. The reason I don't know is because that's not given in the final report, okay? The reason that a incident final report like this is being issued is so that we, the pilots out there, can learn from it. That we can see what other people have done and the investigation team can see if there's any way to get to the root cause of what caused this and fix it so that the flying becomes even safer than it already is. That's everything that the investigation team want to do. And that's also what I want to do with these videos. Now, if you want to see a video about a 737 that ended up flying through a brick wall, well then check out the video up here. I would also love to hear your comments about what you would have done differently if you were in the captain's position. Put that into the comments below. Remember the acronym CLASS and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.